came in our life. Super.
Okay, multi-body dynamicists. It's a Tuesday, 9th of March. It's a quarter to two. Uh, welcome to lecture number four on multi-body dynamics. Today's topic is Lagrange equations of motion, chapter 12. Um, a lot of materials in the book, and I will not be able, of course, to cover everything in this one hour, but I, I want to just show you the, the highlights today. Okay, um, why Lagrange's equations of motion? Well, if you look at the, the, the systems of equations of, of, equation of motion together with the constraints that we derived up until now, uh, we have this type of system, right? We have a mass matrix, oops, a mass matrix, then we have these constraints, the Jacobian, that is, of course, uh, and the constraint equations here. Then we have the unknown accelerations of the center of mass. Then we have these Lagrangian multipliers, eh, the, um, the con which, which serve the purpose of joint constraint forces. And then on the right hand side we have the sum of all the applied forces. And then here we had this these convective terms x dot x dot eh, for shorthand. Okay. Uh, when we look at these equations, then uh, the number of uh, equations n eh, is uh, the number of center of mass coordinates we have in our system. So with the system of uh, many bodies, eh, we have that this n is large, right? Uh, three per body, so if you have ten bodies, it's like thirty. Okay, and then m, Mike, the number of constraint equations, is when you have a lot of constraints, so if all bodies are really interconnected, then m is also large. However, the number of degrees of freedom of the system is equal to, of course, the difference of these two, because these are the free motions, these restrict the motions, and then the difference between these two is the number of degrees of freedom you have. And that can be small. So, small in the order of a, a, a number, one, two, three, or at the most ten, or something like that. So you can have a large number of bodies, a large number of constraints, and only a few degrees of freedom. Now, ideally, you can um, then describe your system with only in these degrees of freedom. And for that we need a concept, and the concept which we are going to use today is called uh, generalized coordinates. Okay, so generalized coordinates. Now what is a generalized coordinate? And um, for example, I have here a generalized coordinate, 52 one and four three six okay now the big question is of course what does this example show well actually it shows it's an example of a generalized coordinate and it's a generalized coordinate you're you're pretty used to uh, this one yeah it's a generalized coordinate you are pretty used to because this is on a globe where you are at the moment. So this position, this is the position on the globe. And this globe, uh, how does it go? Well, the globe uh, has a rotational speed of one rotation per day, right? So that's our Earth, and our location is here. And we call this the, the latitude, and we call this the longitude. And yeah, a generalization would be in a three-dimensional space. Eh? We can be anywhere, somewhere in space. But however, Earth confines us to a two-dimensional space. So there is like this constraint that we have to live on this globe. And in a generalized way, you could say, okay, we, we have this three-dimensional space, right? X, Y, and Z. And then we have some curved surface, eh, part of the globe, and we are on that globe. Now, uh, these latitude and longitude are actually angles, uh, and if I'm 
absolutely right and it goes like this this is the projection then this is i think the longitude and the height is all called the latitude now uh, why is this longitude and let latitude it could also be the other way around right so what uh, why is this long and this let uh, I mean, this is also the same length, and this also. So uh, on a globe, every 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 direction is 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 equal to any other direction. Um, well, actually, it comes from the first sailors, and the first sailors they they sailed on a, on a, not on the big ocean that was too dangerous. So they they found a small small sea somewhere, and where did they find that small sea? Uh, actually, that was in the Mediterranean, right? Mediterranean, Mediterranean, and um, so in the Mediterranean, and they had to navigate there. And of course, the Mediterranean is longer than than, it, than its than its height. So therefore, this we call longitude, and this we call latitude. Okay, back to our. Thing. So now let's go to mechanics to our system. So let's suppose you have this four bar mechanism. Yeah, and it's fixed here. This is bar number one. This is bar number two, bar number three. Now I said four bars, but of course the ground eh, is, is number four. Because that closes the thing. So I have to close it and for now I'm closing it with this rolling support. Okay, and on this I'm gonna, well, of course we have some coordinate system, right? X and Y. Uh, I'm gonna put in some generalized coordinates. And as an example here, I take S as a distance. I take here an angle alpha. Um, yeah, what else can I do? Uh, some relative angle here, beta. As you like it. For generalized coordinates, you can just pick pick any, anything you like. Now, if you do counting on this mechanism, then the number of degrees of freedom, in our case, is uh, well. It's a, if you fix this point, then it's uh, if you fix this point, then uh, it has only one degree of freedom. Eh? This this four bar linkage, but then with this point moving, it has two degrees of freedom. So, meaning, if we want to use a minimal set of generalized coordinates, and the generalized coordinates we could, could, could pick for this one would be, for instance, and I just give a number of examples, um, we could take these two angles. Eh? If you take this angle, then this is defined. If you take this angle, then this is defined, and you just have to flip, make it such that this point touches there, and then you find what this angle is. So, you could say alpha and beta. Well, another smart mouse would say, no, 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 um, uh, I, I'm more like this. I, I, I like the angle alpha, and then we take the distance s. And again, somebody else could say, no, 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 I, I, like, I, like, I like beta and s, etc. I mean, you can continue like forever and ever. However, th there are some deficits. So, for instance, uh, if we take this case, uh, the alpha and the s, so let, let's copy that again. So we take here the alpha, and we take here the s. So alpha, and then here we take s. We, we do have a problem, and that is the following. If we say, well, this defines the configuration, then I can think of another configuration for this mechanism with the same alpha and s, but, but where the system is in, in a totally different configuration, and that, that, that one is, of course, this one, right? Well, that's not very nicely drawn. Oh, that's the alpha. So we flip the thing. So we flip it like here, and then we flip this like that. So that's another configuration. So it's symmetric about this one. So it's, it's either this or that, right? Uh, maybe. No, let's not do that. Oops. Um, and and that is that brings us to the topic of non-uniqueness. So, uh, uh, non-unique configuration configuration for this for the alpha and s.
Uh, we can choose between either this one or, or two. Okay, um, so you have to pay well attention when you make your choice of, of these coordinates. Um, sometimes it's even not possible to find a, a continuous set, then you have to change intermediately. And we also disco discovered, by the way, this non-uniqueness, uh, this bifurcation of the geometry in one of the homework problems, where we had this extra constraint and then the two bars came together in the, in the zero and you had one mode and the other mode. Mm -hmm. Some of you may remember. Anyway, uh, let's continue. So these are generalized coordinates. You, you can pick them. Um, now we have to start with the following word, and that's the word called Lagrange. Now, um, who was Lagrange? Uh, Joseph Louis Lagrange. He wrote a book called Mécanique. Mécanique. Analytic, analytic, yeah. Uh, and he wrote that in 1788. And you could say that this guy was, um, well, he's actually the founder of multi-body dynamics. Multi-body dynamics. Uh, now everybody knows Lagrange, right? And I happen to have a picture of him. Where are we? Lagrange, yeah. So here we are, right? This is, oh, get out of the way. So this is Lagrange. Looks a bit, oh, oh, don't do that. Oh, sorry. Um, so this is Lagrange, right? Um, he looks a bit sad. Eh? If you look at his eyes looking down instead of up, so always look up. And we are on the picture. Uh, quite formal. Uh, now let's talk about the book. So where is the book? Here is the book, Lagrange. There we go. Mécanique analytique par Monsieur de, de Lagrange. You see that in those days uh, the spelling of your name was not always unique. L'Académie des Sciences de Paris, uh, it's in French. Um, by the way, all French people say Lagrange was French, but he wasn't, of course. He's an Italian, right? He's from Torino. Uh, the cell de Berlin, the, the Petersburg, the Turin, ah, eh, Torino, his birthplace, etc., etc. So he, he already got appointed in Paris, Berlin, Petersburg, Turin, and, and many other places. But the book was written in French and it was published in France. Now, blah, blah, blah. Cela devant ce libraire von Monsieur Huppel de Pupchak. Then some strange way of writing a, a date. I'm not so good at it, but it ends on an 8. Right? And uh, something like that. Well. Avec abropation et privilege de roi. That's interesting. So the, it's by a, approval of, of, the, of the king, right? Very nice. Well, the first part is called avertissement. And uh, of course, everybody speaks French, right? Um, but for me, I only speak uh, a little French. And I always say mon franc, français petit. Uh, but still, it doesn't matter so much. We can read this, right? So let's read that together. On déjà plusieurs traites de mécanique. Eh? Today, there are already a lot of books on mechanics. Uh, mind you, this is an advertisement. Eh? Uh, this is to sell your book, to say, hey, you have to buy this book. And how does he start? He said, oh, there are already many books on mechanics. But then the next thing is a qualifier. Mais le plan de celui-ci est entièrement neuf. But the book I present you here, the, the method, the plan, is uh, totally new. And then, je me suis proposé de réduire la théorie de ces sciences et l'art de refonder les problèmes que se rapportent à des formules générales. So he says, well, all the things which I've written now, I can present in a general way, in formulas in a general way. Dans le simple développement, dans tous les équations nécessaires pour la solution de chaque problème. He says, and that gives you all the equations which you need to solve your problem. So it's really a book for you, students. J'espère que la manière dont le tâché de remplir cet objet ne laissera rien à désirer. So, well, this is all, probably all you need. You don't, you don't need anything else. Uh, and then he continues. 
uh, with a lot of other about statics and uh, how that uh, um, set of, uh, uh, you could also use it in other places and there are solutions in that. Uh, then uh, the part, the the the, 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 part, the book is divided in two parts: uh, statics and uh, from equilibrium and dynamics. Uh, the theory of the motion. Uh, that's what we're looking for. Um, and and also uh, corpse fluid, aether fluid. So he not only looks at rigid bodies, but also at at uh, fluids. But now the, the most important part of the book starts. The last thing in the advertisement. And he says there. On ne trouvera point de figure dans cet ouvrage. Well, let me repeat. He said, on ne trouvera point de figure dans cet ouvrage. So, you will, no figures will be found in this book. Now, of course, you and I agree that, together with uh, Alice in Wonderland, what is a book without pictures? I mean, e even Alice already said, uh, a book without pictures, forget it. Eh? But he makes an advertisement for his book by saying there are no figures in the book, no figures can be found. Okay, and what does he mean? He says, Les méthodes que j'expose ne demandent ni construction, ni raison géométrique ou mécanique, mais seulement des opérations algébraïques. He says, you don't need uh, any constructions with lines and rulers, and you don't need any geometry like a perpendicular and the angle between this and that. Uh, but the only thing you need is seulement de operation algebraique. It's algebra. You need to know algebra, and if you're good at algebra, addition, multiplication, and, and summation, then you're in business. Uh, and then he answers: ceux qui aiment l'analyse, for those who, who love analysis, feront avec plaisir la mécanique et devant nouvelle branche et me feront d'avoir entendu aussi le domaine. So he says. Well, for those who like uh, analysis uh, and have uh, f uh, fun in mechanics, uh, hey, you, you can start a whole new branch and, and ev everything is here. And with the book I, I also started a whole new development. And that's true in a sense, because this is the founding of multi-body dynamics. So this is a very important thing. On ne trouvera point de figure dans cet ouvrage. And why does he say it like that? Well, remember from last week when we talked about Newton, when he was I showed his work where these balls were, were reflecting, and, and he was always talking in ratio. So uh, the reflection is in the ratio of 16 to 9 for wooden balls, and from 9 to 10 for glass balls, and, and if the height goes up like this, it comes down like that. And it was always in relation, so relative numbers, and also with constructions, with drawings. No drawings. Now, by the way, uh, don't tell Heike, right? Because this again means you don't need to, you, you need no free body diagrams. You, you can do everything by algebra. Anyway, let's continue. So, what does what does Lagrange do? Well, Lagrange does the following. Uh, his 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 starting point is is energy. Now, what is energy? Uh, energy is uh, the sum uh, of power with respect to time. Uh, so you have a, a, a certain amount of power and times time, you just uh, have to add it up. So Joules is watts times second, right? Now what is mechanical power? Mechanical power can be defined in our, our sense, we call it usually, we use the capital P, and that's the, the, the scalar product of the force times the velocity. Uh, we've seen it before with the virtual power. And then what is energy? The energy of this mechanical power, of course, uh, this mechanical power is then the integral of this with respect to time, so that's the integral of fx dot dt. dt. Okay, now nothing new there. Now what are we going to do? We're going to add some mechanics here, so we're going to add Newton. And how does that go? Uh, with Newton we say, well, uh, Force equals mass times acceleration. Uh, change in speed, you could also say. But okay, we put plug that in our equation. So uh, uh, what we can do is we can multiply both both sides by x dot, and then and then put a put an uh, well. No, let's do it in a nice way. So let's. Oops, I need the dot. So again, I write f equals mx double dot. What do I do? I multiply both times with the velocity, 
right, to get to get power, and then to get energy, I'm going to integrate that with respect to time. And now I'm going to do a little trick. Of course, I'm going to rewrite uh, the uh, speed as by definition dx dt dt, and I'm going to rewrite acceleration as mass times dx dot dt x dot dt. Now I can change boundaries, of course, eh? uh, the dt goes away, and here I get the integral of f dx, eh? uh, so that's force times distance, and on the other side I get mass times velocity times change in velocity. Now uh, suppose, and, and that's, uh, that's uh, f is uh, constant or something like that, eh? for now, like, like gravity, or uh, it, it's not so important, but for now it's, it makes uh, life a bit easier in the derivation. Suppose it's constant, then uh, f. Uh, then what can we do? Well, we can integrate this, right? So uh, we can integrate it from mo one moment in time 1 to mo moment in time 2. So we get f x2 minus x1, eh, because it's constant. And then here we get 1 half m x dot squared, and that's between 2 minus 1 half and x dot squared 1. Now, um, this, this, um, this we call work, eh, by a force, and this we call kinetic energy. And in a sense we now have derived the, the energy balance, meaning to say that uh, this work, and, and sometimes we define the work as a potential energy, and then if you have a potential energy, potential energy function, then that's defined, I think even the definition is like this, like V, no, other way around, that the dV dx is the force F, and then with a minus sign. Anyway, with this definition, of course, if you then do the integral of f dx, you get minus v. So we get minus v equals eh, as this change in potential energy, so plus some constant eh, because we have an initial value. So you could say the kinetic energy plus the potential energy is constant. So that is like this energy conservation for mechanical systems if there is no dissipation. And by definition, then this kinetic energy is one half m x dot squared, and the potential energy uh, is, the definition is as above here, right, that uh, the dv dx is minus f. That's by definition. And if the force is constant, it's just the force times the distance. What is the benefit of this? Well, the, the benefit of such an energy approach is that you, you do not have to um, follow your equation of motion in a step-by-step -step manner, but since you integrate it with respect to time, you can find two discrete moments in time and then compare. For instance, um, suppose you are uh, lord of the manor, you have a, a castle, and, uh, and there is a, a bunch of trees who are trying to conquer your castle. That's a famous old legend, and your castle has a height, h, and there is of course gravity. You have some cannon, and you want to fire with some nozzle velocity v0. Now you have to hit your trees with a certain specific velocity, otherwise you will not kill the trees. So, so how can you find your nozzle velocity to, to determine the speed? And do you want to follow, calculate what the whole trajectory is, or are you actually not interested? Like, oh, I don't want to know, I just want to know how fast this nozzle velocity should be to have my minimal speed here. Well, the answer is, of course, very simple. T plus V is constant, right? So we have here uh, the T0 and the plus the V0, and that should be equal to T1 plus V1. Well, T0 is, of course, this half mv0 squared, plus the gravity, if we take this as, as potential uh, energy level 0, yeah, then it's mgh. In this case, uh, the kinetic energy after impact is this V1, and then the potential energy is C0, and from this we can conclude that the velocity of impact equals the square root 
of this V0 squared plus 2GH. And note that I found this velocity without even solving the whole differential equation and without solving the trajectory, etc. So that is sort of a convenient way. One of the convenient things for energy. There are, of course, far more. Okay, let's go back to our uh, system of rigid bodies. System of rigid bodies. How does the, this all machinery work for our system of rigid bodies? Well, again, the kinetic energy is a scalar, and in our case it's in our notation x dot i m i j x dot j. It's just the, the, the product and the sum of mass times velocity squared with our diagonal mass matrix. And uh, our, our coordinates x i, for x dot i is x dot 1, y dot 1, phi dot 1, x dot 2, etc. at ad infinitum, uh, until the n, the number of bodies you have. And then our, our m i j, our mass matrix, is of course a diagonal matrix, and it has m1, m1, i1, m2, m2, i2, etc. until you have i n. Yeah, so those are, is the kinetic energy. Now, how do we get, how do we get from T plus V is constant to our equation of motion? Well, and to, to discover that we have to backtrack actually the, the, our route here. So we have to start here and say, ah, how do we get back finally to this equation? Zzz, how do we do that? Well, what we did here was uh, we had this energy equation here and then we integrated. So apparently we have to differentiate. Eh? If we differentiate, we can get back to our equation of motion. And how do we differentiate? Well, first of all, if this was, uh, if, we had, if we had our um, our kinetic energy being like this one half m x dot squared, yeah, then if we differentiate with respect to time, then that doesn't really work. So it, remember, we integrated with respect to time, but then we changed our boundary to velocity. So what are we going to do? We're going to first differentiate it with respect to the velocity, x dot i, and now what do we get? We get mx dot, and then we're going to differentiate that with respect to time, dt dx dot, and then we're going to get mx double dot eh, for constant mass systems. For variable mass system, there's a different story, but the whole Newton was also never defined for this variable mass system. You can solve it, but in another way. Okay, then the potential energy, well, remember that the potential energy was actually defined as that the derivative of that guy uh, is the force F. So how do we get the force F? Well, by taking the derivative, we get the force minus the force, right? Okay, with this knowledge, we can then, eh, with these two we can combine, we can say, oh, how do we get Newton from, from this equation, T plus V? Well, we, we take the kinetic energy, partial derivative to all the speeds, then we take that with respect to time, so we then get our mx double dot, and that equals, yeah, uh, you could say that equals, or uh, you could also oh, go back, you could say minus, eh, because there's a minus f here, so plus the dv dxi, and that is, yeah, zero or uh, non we say non-conservative forces. So all the forces we are, which are not, uh, which are not in V. Eh? So we say those are these Fs, Fis. Okay. So let me repeat that again. I'm gonna copy this part. Yeah. Part. Yep. Okay, put a box around it. This is our equation.
equation. So given our energy equation, or given our expression for energy, in our case kinetic energy and potential energy, for the whole multibody system, right? This one is this complex uh, uh, x dot i, m i j, x, x dot j. Uh, some potential energy function, uh, all the, the gravity can put in there, and maybe some, some non-conservative applied forces. However, however, you don't want to use, want to use the xi's and the x dot i's, but you, you like to use uh, generalized coordinates, generalized coordinates, right? And, and we haven't given them a name. For now, let's let's call them Q J, yeah, and and the, uh, the Q oh, that's a G, uh, the Q J's were, for example, uh, this this alpha and this beta, or or the, the alpha and the S, or whatever. And in the case of our, our double pendulum, what would be the Q G J? So here we have one. Here we have the other one. For a double panel, well, we could say, oh, we take this as alpha, and then we take this angle beta, and then our generalized coordinates qj for a double panel is alpha and beta, whereas our xi's are, and this was body one, and this was body two, are x1, y1, phi1, x2, y2, and phi2. So, our coordinates, which are dependent, of course, due to the constraints, but if we then eliminate all the constraints, and we know we can, have, we can describe it with two degrees of freedom, I take this angle, the angle of uh, bar 1 with the horizontal, and I take angle beta, which is the relative angle of bar 2 with respect to bar 1. Of course, eh, you can take other, other cord, generalized coordinates, eh, distances or mixes of angles and distances, but for now, as an example, we do this, to say, oh yeah, we have fewer, uh, less uh, uh, generalized coordinates than we have this COM coordinates. Now, um, everything works with power in our system, right? With power, virtual power. So for that we, we have to um, define the power in the system. Well, if we define the power of the, the external forces, we have that fi x dot i, right? But now the power of the of the uh, generalized coordinates is yeah the velocity of these generalized coordinates times some forces and we call this then generalized forces generalized forces and then the 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 the, the, the generalized forces in our case for instance are easy to identify because the result should be power so there should be a torque here so there should be like a torque T alpha, and that's working on body one, and of course counter working on the ground, T alpha, so that's T alpha, and then energetically there's also some torque, T B, uh, torque beta, working on body two with respect to body one, right? So that is T B. So action reaction torques. So those those are then related to those two, and that makes up this power. Then the last step is that we want to transform not uh, only our coordinates. Eh? We not only want to describe these coordinates in terms of this, but we want to transform all the forces which we have. Eh? F i being f x one, f y one, m one, f x two, f y two, and m two. We want to transform those forces also to the generalized forces. Yeah. Describing those in terms of that, we can do. That, uh, that's easily doable. Well, is it easily doable? Uh, x1 is um, L over 3 cosine alpha. Y1 is L over 3 sine alpha. Phi1 is alpha. Uh, X2 is... Um, so I have to first go to this point, that's L cosine alpha plus L over 3 cosine beta plus alpha, because it was a relative angle. Y2 is L sine alpha plus L over 3 sine alpha plus beta. And phi2 is alpha plus beta. So this transformation from 
from these coins. So this is just writing down your stuff. But how do we get the transformation from these forces to these generalized forces? Because in the end we want to express everything only in these generalized terms, eh? in this minimal set of coordinates. Well, power is again our, our, our thing for that. So the virtual power actually of the applied forces, eh? that's fi virtual velocities i, should of course be identical uh, the, the, the amount of, of uh, power you put in should be identical to the virtual power of these generalized forces times the generalized velocities. And this, this should hold. This is how, how the forces will get... From this we can discover how the forces will get transformed, because there can be no leak in, in, in energy. Okay, well then, uh, and that should hold for all virtual velocities uh, as long as they're not zero. And not all, all these ones, because they have to fulfill a constraint, but these are free. Uh, as long as they're not all, all zero, then they're free, because they are the degrees of freedom. But we can express these velocities in terms of this one. Uh, we can say x dot i was a function of... Uh, sorry, uh, I'm going too quick. We have x i uh, is a function of q j. We, we, we've written that down here. Uh, look here. And of course then we can write x dot i is dx i dq j q dot j. This, uh, we have this nice shorthand notation, right? x i comma j uh, q dot j. And not only the real velocities, but also the virtual velocities. Virtual velocities is Jacobian times virtual generalized velocities. This now we plug in here, and we get finally this fi times xi comma j virtual dot j equals qj virtual q dot j for all virtual velocities as long as they're not zero. And the conclusion is of course then you can take a virtual velocity First, one zero 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 one zero etc. So you get J type of equations. So we get Q J equals X I J times F I, and this is the way how forces get transformed. Or maybe it's helpful to write it out eh, in terms of Jacobian. Q J is this Jacobian D X I D Q J times F I. So this is this the way how things are transformed. Now we go back to our equation, and then uh, remember we had the equation. What did it look like? Um, we had our equation of motion in terms of the x i's and x dot i. Yes, was the time derivative of the partial of the kinetic energy with the speeds plus the potential energy. And that equaled our, oops, and that was equal to our, need a little bit more space here, and that was equal to our uh, applied forces, right? So this was just our Newtonian mechanics equation. And these are forces which are not in the potential, these are in the potential. Now what are we going to do? We're going to pre-multiply with this x i q j. Do that here too, x i eh, with this Jacobian, and then we say, ah, yeah, that's of course our q j. So what we got here is uh, a degenerated set of equations of motion, a smaller set of equations of motion, because we have only j eh, in our double pendulum. It's two equations, and then how do we get that uh, by by operating this? However. We don't want to see the axis. The axis should all go away. We only want to see Q's. I only want to see QJ and Q dot J and QJ. How do we get that? Well, of course you have the idea, and of course what I'm now going to do is, I, I'm not going to write it here, but you think, oh, here's an X on, uh, uh, at the... Um, at the uh, nominator 
Dat is de nominator, dat is de denominator. Het is een nominator. En hier is een x uit de denominator. Well, there's a dot, so we have to fix that maybe. And here's an x at the nominator, and here's an x at the denominator. Well, actually, this and this we can fix immediately. We can write immediately if you have a dx, dxi, dqj times dv, dxi, then that's equal to dv, dqj. So th th that's solved. Eh? We have solved this part. But this part is a bit more complex. So let's focus on that. So that's this Jacobian. Qj times, and then we have a time derivative, dt dx dot i. Now, I can put the, this inside here, but to do that, I, I differentiate a little bit too much with respect to time, and then I have to subtract something. So, let's put that in, so d dt, I put that in the equation, Qj, and then times this. But that's not correct, of course, because if I differentiate that, I keep this constant and I differentiate that, and I keep this constant and I differentiate that. So I have to subtract that. So I keep this constant and I differentiate that. So I differentiate this. So d dt of dx i dqj times dt dx dot i. So this is totally equivalent, right? By putting that in and then subtracting that. So this part, this product part is now equal to this. Uh, now we have we have no dot here and we have a dot there, but uh, trust me, I'm a doctor. Uh, this one is totally equal to dx dot i dq dot j. Or in other words, the Jacobian of the of the coordinates is totally identical to the Jacobian of the of the velocities. And if you if you don't believe me, read the book or just look at your homework. There you see it. Okay, so d d t in front of it. And why do I do that? Well then I can cross out these two, right? And they come up. And then what is this? Well The other thing is, the other doctor you have to trust is that the time derivative of this Jacobian is equal to the Jacobian of the speed with respect to these coordinates. So apparently this differentiation only works on the, on the, on the uh, nominator, um, which makes sort of sense. Well, no, 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 doesn't make, doesn't make, forget it, doesn't make sense. You just have to read the book and follow the derivation. And then we get this guy. And then we can cross out these guys. Finally, what do we see? We have here the time derivative of the kinetic energy with respect to the velocities minus the kinetic energy with respect to the coordinates. And if we then summarize, we add all, all up, then we get the following thing. The generalized forces equals the time derivative of the kinetic energy, which is with respect to the generalized speeds, minus the, the partial derivative with respect to the coordinates, plus partial derivative of that. Those are all these other forces. And this we call Lagrange's equations of motion. And and that that is that is a, actually a very yeah a very nice and compact way of describing your equations of, the deri derivation of your equations of motion. It's like a one liner, eh? it's like almost looks like one equation. If you make vectors and so on out of it you can write it as a sort of one vector equation. You get then a mat matrix vector set, and that's apparent to your equations of motion. Now, wh what do we need to, to then to derive the equations of motion? Well, we, we need, first of all, to define generalized coordinates. Uh, we need to define either forces are in a potential function, so we need to define a potential function, or we say, no, no, we put the forces just as forces, uh, generalized forces, 
but then in terms of these, these generalized coordinates, or we use the transformation rule. And we need to have a thing called kinetic energy for the system. But that should be expressed in terms of our generalized coordinates and their speeds. Now, I want to use 15 minutes um, to, to do a very small example to show what the workflow is for this Lagrange equation of motion. And then we take a short break, a couple of minutes break, and then we continue with the questions and answers. So the lecture will continue until a quarter to three. Yeah. Okay, so example. Let's do an example with the Lagrange equations. How does it work? And then I take a very simple case, super simple case, where you don't see the advantage actually of, of the Lagrange method, but where you see how the system works. So here we have some distance coordinate s from an inertial system. So this is inert. And uh, we call this x, and we call this y, and this is then the origin, right? So we have a distance s, and then we have a pendulum with just a simple bob, mass here. And uh, we have an angle phi here, uh, the distance is l. There is gravity here, and yeah, we denote the position. It's, it's a point mass, right? So it's just one point mass. So our COM coordinates xi would be just x and, and y. Um, actually, the word alpha is n the phi is not so smart. I'm going to use another symbol, alpha. Okay. Now we know it has two degrees of freedom, x and y, right? um, and and we're going to use generalized coordinates q j being this distance s and this angle alpha. Now, most of you would say, well, that doesn't really help, right? I have as many central mass coordinates as I have general coordinates. Yes, that's true, but it's it's just to show a case. How does it work? Uh, of course, you can think, oh, this is a rigid body with a position and an orientation of I have a whole system. But for now, let's try and keep it simple. We do this very simple problem. And I'm going to define my, uh, I'm going to do the Lagrange's equations of motion. And for that I need an expression for the kinetic energy in terms of our generalized coordinates and our speeds. And I need a, an expression for my potential energy and maybe also some applied forces if we, know, if we, if we need them, QJs. Okay, um, why? Well, again, to repeat that, eh? and it's good to repeat it because by how, how more often you write it, how better you keep it in your memory. Plus dv dqj is... This is how we're going to derive our equation of motion. So clearly we need these expressions. Okie dokie. Um, well, kinetic energy for our mechanical system was uh, one half x dot i m i j x dot j, right? And the potential energy, in our case, is something like mgy, eh, the, the height in our thing. The first step we need, of course, as we saw, we need to express our coordinates in terms of our generalized coordinates. So we need the xi in terms of qj. Uh, then we need to repeat the picture, right? So let's go there. No, that doesn't work. Uh, duplicate. Uh, let's put that here. Doesn't work. Yeah, okay. Now we go back to our 100%. Oh, that's not so nice. Uh, oh, not so nice, not so nice. I'm not so happy with that. Uh, let's redo that. Yeah, copy. I'm going to paste it here and I'm going to make it a little bit smaller. Oh, 
Come on. A little bit smaller, yeah. That's good. Okay. Oh, this is strange scaling. Well, here we know. Okay, X1. No, I'm not so happy with it actually. X1 is, so the coordinate of this point is S plus L sine alpha, right? Y1 is minus L cosine alpha. And we're done. Then we need an expression for our velocities. X dot 1 is um, S dot plus L cosine alpha alpha dot, y dot 1 is um, L sine alpha alpha dot. Well, kinetic energy in our case is just 1 half m x dot squared plus 1 half m y dot squared, coming to 1 half m times s dot squared plus 2 L s dot phi dot cosine alpha plus L squared alpha dot squared cosine squared alpha. So that's this part. And then Y dot squared is just L squared alpha dot squared sine squared alpha. So that's the kinetic energy, clearly a function of the speeds, right? but also of the coordinate. Eh? So as, as written here, uh, where was that? It's, it's not only of the speeds, but now also of the coordinates, and that's because we use generalized coordinates. In the other case, the mass matrix or the mass terms were just constant. Okay, and the uh, potential energy, as I said, is uh, uh, that's uh, mg, uh, this force which is acting here, times the height, and the height is um, yeah, uh, minus L uh, cosine alpha. Yeah, now it looks like yeah, that, that's not very nicely written, right? So it's uh, minus mgl cosine alpha. So clearly uh, some function of the the the, um, the coordinate. Okay, uh, yeah, that was good, right? Now, uh, now, now it's it's just math. It's just algebra, like like in the book of Lagrange, eh, where he says, uh, uh, well, you you, or you you only need uh, algebraic operations, eh? and the algebraic operations is first uh, do the derivative with respect to the speed, and then with respect to time, and this, and then with respect to the coordinates. So. First, we take this uh, this re with respect to speed. So s dot. So with s dot, we get uh, m s dot. So that's this first part. Then oh, the ha this half and this two goes away. Then we get plus m l phi dot cosine uh, alpha. Why do I say phi? It should be alpha, right? Alpha dot cosine alpha. Yeah. Then here there is no S, and here there is also no S. Yeah. By the way, we can simplify this, eh? like L squared alpha dot squared. Okay, then the dt, the alpha dot. Uh, again, no alpha dot here. Here is an alpha dot. There was a phi dot, but it is an alpha dot, of course. One half goes away, so we get ML. Then we get s dot, yeah, and then we get cosine alpha. Yeah. Note this is only with respect to the velocities. And then here, of course, uh, l squared we get uh, plus um, m l squared alpha dot. Then we have to do with respect to time. So this now d d t, yeah. So we get um, 
m s double dot plus m l alpha double dot cosine alpha plus and now we have to also differentiate this guy uh, with respect to alpha and an alpha with respect to time so we get um, uh, what do we get uh, minus so that was a minus right m l alpha dot squared sine alpha yeah and for the second equation we get with respect to time we get m l s double dot cosine alpha minus m l s dot alpha dot sine alpha yeah yeah and then plus m l squared alpha double dot. Then the potential energy, the dv ds is zero, it's not a function of s, d, is e, d alpha is m g l sine alpha. A and uh, for our case, our qj's were all zero, right? We had no other applied, no other applied forces. Then we can combine everything, so we just add everything up. So we get for the first equation m s double dot plus m l cosine alpha alpha double dot minus m l alpha dot squared sine alpha. And then this guy was zero, right? Plus zero is, yeah, you could say that the t, the, the t s or the f s or, uh, although uh, this, is, this is Fs and this is T alpha. But, but. Uh, and then the second equation is of course this guy. So that's ML S double dot cosine alpha minus ML S dot alpha dot sine alpha plus ML squared alpha double dot. Uh, oh, I forgot of course to do a, a set of terms, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, in all the haste, I forgot to do this set. The dt ds is of course zero, and the dt d alpha was, um, yeah, kinetic energy with respect to alpha. Well, there is a cosine alpha here, so that's m l s dot alpha dot sine alpha ml s dot alpha dot sine alpha. Oh, I forgot those terms. So here plus null plus zero. Yeah, another one. Put that here. And zero. And then here minus ml s dot. Eh? Remember it was minus sine alpha. Uh, and then plus mgl sine alpha equals t alpha. Then we have to combine all stuff. And we want to write it, of course, as something times the accelerations is forces. So we get s double dot alpha double dot. And then we just take all the parts, plug them in and left and right. And so first equation, it's m times s double dot. And it's ML cosine alpha times alpha double dot. And then all the other stuff goes to the other side. So we get an FS, eh, that's some applied force, which, yeah, if you draw a picture, if this is S and this is this pendulum, then, then this should be the force FS, right? Uh, okay. Yeah. Then, uh, and then this goes to the other side, plus ML alpha dot squared sine alpha. And then the second set of equations, uh, we get this guy, ML cosine alpha times S double dot, and then plus ML squared alpha double dot, and then all the other stuff goes to the other equation. Now, there is some uh, minus sign, error because this one shouldn't disappear with this one. 
and then we only get on the right hand side T alpha minus MgL sine alpha. And these are then our equations of motion in terms of our generalized coordinates. Now, I am happy with this. Why am I happy? Because um, this is symmetric. Eh? I have the same term here as here, and the derivation was independent, so this, this I'm, I'm happy with that. Also dimension-wise, I'm happy, so this is mass times acceleration. This is angular acceleration times mass times distance squared, so uh, that, that, that's a torque, eh? that makes also sense. This is also a torque, restoring torque of gravity, eh? gravity pu pushing it back again, so the minus sign. So here we have some centrifugal term of the thing rotating with some speed, so there's a centrifugal force and it has a component here. Anyway, it looks, it looks okay. Okay, how am I doing with time? Yeah, that finishes now. And then we go to the Q and 8 in Zoom. And then I have to mention a time uh, at 14, 4, 8. So, and I leave that on for you to see. So the, the thing is, take a break, right? Take a break. So I go to Zoom. Here I stop the recording.